Today we'll be talking about query optimization. Um, this is a really important topic in, in database systems. So again, I'm here at my house. I have the Terrier over there who's, who's we'll be asking questions as we go along. Um, so when we say query optimization, the idea at a high level is that we wanna take a, uh, a query that's written in a declarative language like SQL, and we wanna then translate that into a execution plan that the database system can execute. And so with query optimization, the idea is that we want to find a correct execution plan that will have potentially the lowest cost. So the two words that I'm emphasizing here are correct and cost. Correct is kind of obvious. It doesn't help us if we find a really fast plan that ends up computing the wrong answer, returning the wrong result for our query. Like th that doesn't help us at all. Um, and the term cost is in quotes because the cost is going to be this relative metric that's not necessarily tied to a real world metric. It's just something that's, that the data system would say, this is the best query for me to execute. So the cost could be in terms of uh, execution time, could be in terms of monetary cost. If we're running this on a you know, pay-as-you-go cloud system, it could be in memory usage. Right? It could be, could be any possible thing, but at a high level, it's you know, some objective function that the, the database system knows that it, that it wants to optimize for. So the query optimizer is gonna be the hardest part we're gonna to have to touch or a, a component we're gonna to have to implement in the database system because finding a you know, optimal or near optimal query is gonna be super challenging. It's, going to, it's proven to be a MP complete problem. So, this means that although the name of the component we're gonna build is, is usually called the query optimizer, we're almost never gonna be able to find the optimal plan because it, it would just take too long to, to, to look at all possible solutions or all possible query plans and, and pick the, the best one. So what these upcoming lectures are really about are the techniques that we'll use to simplify the, and reduce the search space so that it's not an exhaustive search and techniques we can use to estimate what the plan cost will be without actually having to really execute it. So this makes more sense as we go further along and we talk about cost models, but the, the way to think about this is, if we needed to estimate what, what, what is the cost of, one, of executing one query plan, to get that true cost, we could just execute the query. But now if you want to look at thousands and thousands of possible different query plans, that's not feasible for us to do. So we need a way to estimate it. And this cost thing is also going to be a internal metric that the data system uses to determine whether one plan is better than, an, better than, better than another, and it may not necessarily be tied to uh, uh, you know, the, the wall clock time or a real cost. So this is just sort of to set us up on what we mean when we, when we start talking about query op optimization. The, for the next three weeks, we're going to have discussing a lot of different things uh, in, in, in this, in this, uh, for query optimization. So as I said, as I said, at the end of the last class, uh, I will fully admit that query optimization is the, the one aspect of database systems that I know the least about, and I'm always trying to learn more. Um, and so this year we've expanded the discussion to include an extra lecture on, uh, sort of extra query optimization uh, methods beyond the traditional two method, two, two approaches that we'll talk about this lecture and the next lecture. So where we're going for the next three weeks over the next four lectures is that we'll spend time at the beginning talking about how to, to implement a query optimizer. Essentially, what does the search strategy look like? This the, sort of the search engine inside of it look like. Then we'll talk about how to plan uh, rewriting, uh, query rewriting, plan enumeration. And then we'll talk about uh, sort of uh, more sort of sophisticated techniques to do ad adaptive query optimization. Um, and we'll finish up with talking about cost models. So I'll briefly touch on what a cost model is, I think a little bit in this lecture, but that'll be sort of the end, the end thing to say, well, after we design all this, this search stuff uh, that we're talking about here, the cost model is what, is what we're gonna use to sort of guide that search. So the, uh, for today, we're gonna mostly talking about optimization search strategies. Because that's uh, sort of the, one of the two main parts you need to have. 
Um, and and then that'll then segue into uh, these these other these other uh, topics. So for today, again, as I said, we'll start talking about search strategies because that's the most important thing, um, and that's sort of the basics of what you need to actually implement a query optimizer. Um, and then we'll go through uh, the different approaches people have tried to building a query optimizer over the last uh, 50, 40, 50 years. And then that'll motivate uh, why we want to use a more sophisticated dynamic programming technique or the cascades technique that you guys will read about uh, for next class. So today is sort of like a bunch of background information that then leads up, up into the, the, the modern implementations. So at a high level, the, uh, the, 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 the stack of the system that we're talking about, and, you know, what I'll sort of refer to the front of the system, is going to look like this. Right? This is the part that we're talking about now in our system. So we start with a SQL query that the application sends us. We can first pass that into a SQL rewriter, uh, which means that we'll transform the SQL string itself to annotate it or modify it in a certain way. Uh, and this is this is optional. Not all systems have this. You see this sometimes in middleware systems that are doing uh, sharding, and sometimes can rewrite the SQL query to uh, to add in you know go to this table or, or sorry go to this this node versus that node. But this is sort of this is like SQL query in SQL query out. You're just modifying the SQL query. Then we take the SQL query, run it through our SQL parser, and then that will spit out a abstract syntax tree that just has the tokens, the, the string tokens of, of the query, right? What, you know, the token of the table name or the column names and so forth. And then now we pass this into the binder, which does lookups in the system catalog of the database system to map the table names in, in the, that, that are referenced in the query or the column names that are referenced in the query into internal, internal identifiers. So this allows you to get like the, 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 the type of the columns, whatever constraints you have on those columns and so forth. So then the binder would then spit out what, what is now called a, a logical plan. So this is a high level description of what the query wants to do. Right, so I, if I have a select query that wants to access table foo, my logical plan will be, will just say scan table foo. It doesn't say how I want to scan it, it just says I want to access it. Then we can take that logical plan and pass it into a, another optional step called the, the tree rewriter. And this is again, logical plan in, logical plan out. These are, are, think of these as like heuristics we can apply to manipulate the structure of the tree uh, for some optimizations that we know we always wanna do and we don't need to, to estimate the cost of the change we wanna make. So like we can do like a predicate push down here or sometimes you see rewriting uh, view queries or CTEs into uh, nested queries this way. Again, this is entirely optional. Then we now feed this into our, our optimizer and at a high level, we'll be, calling, you know, we'll be focusing on a cost-based query optimizer, right? Where we have some cost estimates that are based on statistics that we've collected from the database itself that allow us to predict or estimate, you know, what's the execution time of a particular query plan. And then again, this is where we can enumerate a bunch of different options and choose the one plan that, that we think is gonna have uh, the, the lowest cost. And so once the optimizer is done with this step, then it fits out a, spits out a physical plan that we can go off and execute it. Now, in the case of our system, uh, and the, when we talk about query compilation, we take that physical plan and then we use, we have code generation to convert it into a domain specific language that we then compile into machine code. Right? But other systems, you could take this physical plan and start interpreting it and executing it right away. Right, so this is, this is at a high level uh, where we're going uh, for today and the, the upcoming lectures. So we're mostly going to be focusing on these two parts here, the tree rewriter and the optimizer. For SQL rewriting, as I said, that's mostly done, uh, you're not really doing that for optimizations, you're doing it for uh, like redirecting queries or... Um, yeah, it's, it's mostly it's almost like control plane stuff, not necessarily for execution stuff. And the binder, there's not really any magic you you do there. It's looking up for for, for you know looking up table names and things like that. All right, so let's now discuss this distinction between the logical and physical plan because this is going to come up multiple times when we talk about query optimizers. So the essentially what the optimizer is trying to do is trying to map a logical algebra expression of the query itself into a equivalent physical 
algebra expression. So as I said, like the logical plan would say, I want to access table foo. The physical plan would say, access table foo using index you know, X, Y, Z, or access table foo using a sequential scan or a binary search on the actual table itself. Right, so this, at a high level, this, the, the distinction is that the physical plan tells you how you actually want to execute a, you know, the, the query itself. But the logical plan says that this is what I want the query result to be. So the, the physical plan operators themselves, it's going to have low level information that is specific to the physical properties and the physical format of the data that they're accessing. So in some cases, the physical uh, operators will know that it's, it's producing a uh, data that's sorted on, on a given column or know that's going to be operating on data that's compressed in a certain way and maybe ne needs to decompress it into another way. Um, the logical plan has no notion of this. It just knows about relations. So one important thing we'll see, and this will come up when we talk about cascades in the next class, is that the, there's not always going to be a one-to-one -one mapping from logical operators to physical operators. So what I mean that is like in the case of like access table foo, I can imagine easily how that would be mapping the logical operator to access table foo to a, you know, a sequential scan to access table foo. That would be one to one. But sometimes we'll have logical operators that could then expand into multiple physical operators. Uh, and likewise, you could take a multiple logical operators and, and and coalesce them into a single physical operator. It depends on the implementation of the database system. Usually you see logical operators being exploded into more operators. That's more common than, than the other way, in my opinion. Like, uh, I actually take that back, right? So uh, a, a logical join with a logical order by could be merged into a uh, physical sort merge join because you're doing, this, you know, doing the, the, the join and the order by together. All right, so a, another important aspect about what we're doing here relies on this notion of relational algebra equivalencies. Again, this is something that we've covered in the introduction class last semester, but the basic idea is that since we know the commutativity and associativity and trans transitivity properties of relational algebra expressions, we know uh, we can define rules that allow us to do transformations of the query plan in such a way that we know that the end result is equivalent to the original plan. So in this case here, if I'm doing natural joins between uh, tables A, B, and C, in, if I join B and C first, then take the result of that join and now join it with A, well, that's equivalent to me joining A and C first and then taking the output of that and, and joining B. And I can do this because this is an inner join or a natural join where I have the commutativity property and I can reorder them any way I want. Left outer joins, you can't, quite, you can't do that because they're, they're asymmetric, whereas these things are symmetrical. So I can flip these around in any order that I want. So now you can kind of see what the optimizer is actually going to try to do is if it, if it knows it needs to join table A, B, and C together, it's going to try to figure out what is the correct, correct ordering I should do for you know, joining B and C first or joining A and C first and so forth. And it can use a cost model to estimate which of these join orderings is going to be uh, most efficient. Then now you can think about the physical operators as well. I can now decide well, what, what algorithm do I want to use to actually do this join? Do I want to do the sort merge stuff we talked about before? Or do I want to do my parallel hash join and so forth? So th for these lectures, we're mostly going to be focusing on analytical queries because in this world, the, uh, the, the difficulty or challenge in finding an optimal query plan is much more, you know, is, is much greater than doing this for OLTP workloads or transaction processing workloads. And this is because most of the time, the, the queries in OLTP workloads are considered to be what is called sargeable. And sargeable is a, short, uh, is a uh, acronym for the search argument able. It's some term they made up in the 80s. I, I don't know why, whatever. Um, and for these sargeable queries, the reason why it, they're going to be easy for us to do query planning on is because in old speed workloads, you're almost always doing lookups on, on a, you know, a small number of tables at a time. And you usually have index defined uh, on the attributes you're trying to do lookup, lookups on in these tables. So the, the many times the, the challenge is just trying to pick what is the best index for me to use uh, for this particular query. All right, so say I have a simple table foo, 
it has two columns, int and name, uh, and int, or sorry, ID and name. ID is the primary key. So if I have a query that comes along that does an, uh, you know, uh, there's an equality predicate where ID equals one, two, three, there's not really any complex search I need to do to figure out what the best access method is to access table foo here. I just look at my catalog and say, well, I know I'm doing an equality predicate on the ID field. Uh, I have a primary key on the ID, so therefore it has to have an index. So I know in this case here, I just use that index to do the, to do the lookup. And I don't need to you know, even consider what are the other possible indexes I, I want to choose. Um, likewise, for, for, for joins, they're almost always going to be in an OTP setting on a foreign key. Uh, some applications are not well designed, so you, they, they may have not defined a foreign key. Uh, some, sometimes you see sort of the applications written by people that may not know what they're doing in databases. So clearly it should be a, a foreign key, but they just didn't define it that way in the schema. Um, but even then, uh, you still figure it out pretty, fairly easily. But in this case here, like, if you have a foreign key relationship and you know you have a small cardinality, you know, there's going to be an index uh, to enforce that, that, that referential integrity in the parent table. So again, when you want to do your join, it's, it's pretty easy to pick out. Like the, the parent table should be the outer, outer table and then the inner table is the, the, the foreign key child and I'm doing a nested loop index probe or a, a nested loop index join to, to join these two tables together. So again, in this environment uh, for OTP queries, it's usually pretty simple to do query planning, um, and you can get by doing simple the simple heuristics based optimizer, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Um, MongoDB is probably the most famous database system uh, out around today that still uses uh, sort of basic heuristics to do things like this. Because in in the, the type of workload that they originally were targeting, uh, they weren't doing complex joins because they didn't really add joins until only a few years ago. So, you know, in this world, they, they, they could get by with simple heuristics. All right, so I also talked briefly about cost estimation uh, in the beginning. Again, the idea here is that we have, a, we have a, a query comes in, we have a logical plan, and we want to figure out what's the best physical plan to execute, uh, you know, to represent for that, that, that logical plan. Um, and so we have to use a cost estimator to predict what that, you know, what, what would be the execution cost of executing that, that physical plan or one of the physical plans. And then we can use that to determine uh, which physical plan is, is prefer preferable to, to the other one. So there's a bunch of things we could use to figure out what should be our, our, our cost. Uh, we can look at to see how the query is gonna interact with other queries running at the same time. That's actually pretty tricky and few systems actually do this. A real common thing is to say, well, what's the intermediate size? Or what's the output size of all my operators? And sort of use that as a proxy for what resources I'll use. Um, it could be just like the asymptotic analysis of the algorithms we're, 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 we're using for our physical operators. Like we know a hash join is going to be more efficient or you know, have incur less, uh, uh, you know, less IOs or less overhead than a nested loop join, right? So we can bake that into our cost one estimates how much CPU or memory I'm going to use, and then uh, some information about what does the data actually look like. Like, where is it physically located? How is it compressed? Right? All these things we can incorporate into our cost models to make estimates of what will be the, the cost of executing a, a physical plan. Now, this is super hard to do because you're estimating based on a summarization of what the data looks like. Because again, I can't scan the table and say, oh, how many tuples do you have? Or what's the distribution of these values? Because you might as well just execute the query. And for really large databases, that's not feasible. So you're trying to estimate this as quickly as possible because you want to you evaluate as many physical plans as you can uh, as quickly as possible so that you maybe find the optimal one. So this should be not next week, but uh, in two weeks, we'll, we'll discuss more about cost models. Um, and we'll see how wrong they actually actually get, and this can this can make this can lead an optimizer to make bad decisions. All right, so let's talk about now how to actually build an optimizer. So the there's some first design decisions we need to consider before we can actually say what is the search strategy that we're going to use to enumerate plans and, and look for a uh, you know uh, an optimal plan. So we're going to go through each of these topics one by one by one. But optimization granularity will be the, you know, what are we, what's the, sc the scope of what we're looking at when we do query planning? 
uh, when we fire these off, how to handle player prepare statements, plan stability, and then when to finish the search. So again, we'll go through each of these. So the optimization granularity is what is the scope of the search problem that the optimizer is going to have to deal with. And the choices are to either do it on a single query or do it with multiple queries. So single query is, is the most common approach because oftentimes this is all that you really have. Like a client opens connection, sends a SQL query. You're not going to wait around to see what other queries show up from other connections. You take that one query and you run it through the optimizer at that point in time, right? And the advantage of doing this is that you're going to have a, obviously a much, much, potentially much smaller search space because you're only dealing with that one query at a time. Um, you typically also don't reuse the search results across queries. So you're essentially starting the search from scratch every single time. Now we can talk about uh, some techniques in adaptive query optimization, how to, how, to, how to sort of bridge information you've learned from one search to the next. Um, but typically most database systems don't do this. The other aspect of it is like, um, if you wanna start figuring out like how much uh, resources I'm gonna use when I execute my query, you may have to consider what other queries running at the same time. So again, like if you can do those with multiple queries, but if you're doing with a single, if you, you do this with a single query much easily than you can do with multiple queries because you don't have to worry about what those multiple queries are, how they're interfering with each other at the same time. Multiple queries, as I said, is more rare. This would be like, if I know I'm gonna execute a thousand queries in my application right now, rather than me issuing them one, at, one after another, like issue one, execute it, get the result, issue the next one, I could, in theory, give the database system a batch of queries and have it figure out a single plan for the entire, all those queries that it just executes and it knows how to route the requests or uh, route data between operators that are shared or not shared and produce the output for those, each of those individual queries. So as I said, this mostly appears in maybe the sort of stream processing systems or continuous, uh, continuous query systems where I have queries that is going to run forever because there's some you know, pipe of data coming in all the time and I'm, and I'm processing them. Um, it did appear in academic systems. There was a system called ShareDB that does something similar. Materialized views are another way to sort of achieve this. Um, but uh, as I said, this is, for most applications, this is not the interface. Or this is not how they're going to interact with the data system. They're going to do it this way. I open a connection, send my query. The optimizer takes it, plans it, and then runs it. The next question we got to deal with is when are we actually going to you know, fire off the query optimizer? So, so this first one, again, this is the most common one. This is static optimization would be the query shows up in, in the system. I run it through my optimizer. I generate a plan for that query. And then once I leave the optimizer, I never go back to the optimizer and I, I just go and, and execute the query. So it doesn't matter if like I, so at the time of the optimizer, it's picking what it thinks is the best plan. But it may turn out to be when I actually run the query, it, it, it's not as good as I thought it was. I thought it was, but I can't go back. Like it's sort of, a, it's a, like I said, it's a static plan. Once the optimizer says, this is what you're going to use, you're stuck with it, right? So now, the, uh, as we talk about many times, the, the, the quality of these plans will generate will be highly dependent on the cost model accuracy. That's really true for everything, but essentially in this case here, since you can't go back and tell the optimizer you're wrong, like you, you told me something, you, what you told me was wrong, you know, pick something better, you, you're, you know, you're more dependent maybe than these other ones here. Now, the other thing you can deal with too is it, instead of having to run this optimizer for every single query over and over again, especially if it's the same query, uh, you can amortize this cost using prepared statements and potentially, you know, have a longer time to do query planning than you would, would normally otherwise. We'll talk about uh, uh, the, the cutoff threshold for, for the search of the optimizer in a second, but Think about this as like, you know, when I open up Postgres, I open up MySQL, whatever terminal I'm using for my data system, I type a SQL query in, I hit enter, and then I get back a result. Like in that time, it's gonna run through the optimizer and generate, you know, a physical plan, then actually execute the query. And in some cases, the queries can run in, in milliseconds. Uh, so if I have a more complex query that I don't wanna have it, you know, you know, I'm gonna execute this all the time, and therefore I wanna spend some extra time to do a better job looking for an optimal plan, uh, I can potentially do that with prepared statements. And we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a few more slides. Another approach uh, that is, as far as I know, this doesn't really exist in 
uh, sort of relational SQL-based database systems today. It mostly shows up potentially in, uh, in stream processing systems, but, but I might be wrong. Um, and the idea here is that my query shows up, I generate a logical plan for it. Uh, don't want to restart. Um, I generate a logical plan for it, and then I break that plan up into sort of subgroups of subplans. And before I execute a subplan, then I run it through the optimizer to generate the physical plan, and then I execute it. And then now I'm going to learn some information of, of what the output of that subplan will be that I can then use to, to guide the optimizer to find the, 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 the next subplan or next pipeline I want to execute. I can have it then generate physical plan using the, the information I've collected from running the first one. You're sort of iteratively building up the, the physical plan by going back and forth between the execution engine and, and the optimizer, right? Um, so this is, this is rare. I, again, I don't think any commercial system actually does this approach. Uh, we'll see in a sec, Ingress actually does this. And there, it wasn't so much they were doing this approach for, uh, because they were sophisticated, because they were limited to the sophistication of what the, of what, what they could actually do in the software and the query planner at the time. Um, but I think this, this approach exists in academic systems, but I, again, I don't think it exists in any commercial systems. Um, the, the last one that does, this one actually does exist in commercial systems today is this idea called adaptive query optimization, or sometimes called hybrid optimization. And the idea is that you still do this first step where you go through the, the query shows up, you go through the optimizer the first time, it generates you a plan, but then you, your plan's also gonna include, include these built-in sort of uh, watermarks or thresholds you can use to determine whether the estimates that the cost model used in the first step when it generated the plan the first time, whether those estimates are actually matching up with what you're seeing when you, when you access the data. So like if I thought my query was very selective, or so my predicate was very selective, but then I, I run the query and I see the predicate is not selective at all, then if you identify that the, the, there's a, the error rate for your estimations, it's exceeding some threshold, then you can either pivot and change the plan on the fly right there, or you can just give up and go back to the query optimizer and say, hey, your plan was wrong, make me a new one, make, make me a better one. So the, again, we'll talk about this uh, in, in two weeks. This, this, this one here is you bake in the query plan itself, additional uh, alternatives. And so you can sort of pivot or change based on what the thresholds are. This one is literally like saying, just stop executing the query and go back to the optimizer. So in the easiest way to do this is just to throw everything away and start over from scratch. And the idea is that you, you're, you're, you're making the gamble that the physical plan you generate the first time is so bad that you're better off throwing away any work you've already done going back to the optimizer, getting a new plan, because that new plan will be even more efficient than just letting the first one run to its end. Uh, another approach is to then to recognize how much work you've already done. And then you go back to the optimizer and say, I've already done, you know, I've already scanned or joined these two tables. So generate me a new plan that has, that doesn't change that part, right? Because that part's fixed. I've already computed it. Um, I think everyone pretty much does the, the throw everything away and start over, at least in the commercial systems today. All right, so uh, let's talk about prepared statements. So let's say I have a query here um, that wants to do a three-way join on, on tables A, B, C. Um, and I have some kind of input parameters here that I can use to, to filter out the, the, the tuples from these two tables. So let them, this is the simple query, right? This three-way join is, doesn't, it's gonna take no time to execute. But let's say it takes a long time, right? Uh, and let's say maybe it takes, it takes 10 seconds to, to run it through the query optimizer, um, but the query only takes one second to run. So in that case, every single time I, I execute this query, say I'm executing over and over again, I don't wanna pay that 10 second search cost for a query that's gonna only take one second. So what I can do instead is, I can declare it as a prepared statement, um, and it's essentially I'm giving this, this, this query here, this name my query, and now I use the execute command to, in, to invoke it. All right, so now in this case here, uh, the, the database system could, since it's told ahead of time what the query is gonna be as a prepared statement, it can run it through the optimizer, take that 10 seconds, cache the plan, and now every, every single time I invoke it, I'm just getting that plan again, 
right? So, that, so now it runs super fast without paying the cost to go to the optimizer. So in this case here, this, this is a super simple example. This would work, right? There's no issues here. But let's say that uh, I want to execute this query uh, over and over again, but maybe not use these values that I have here uh, on, on the, on, to do this, the predicates in the where clause. Maybe I want to change these uh, for every single query. So to do this, I can replace the constant values with question marks, or sometimes dollar signs, um, to indicate that these are input parameters. And now uh, I declare, when I declare my prepared statement, I say these are the, the three parameters you can pass in and their types. And now when I invoke the query, it's like a function call where I pass in these actual values, right? So now the tricky thing is gonna be though, is what should the physical plan actually look like in terms of join ordering for this query if I don't know what these values are at the time I'm told, hey, prepare the statement for me, right? So if, you know, it, it, maybe the first time I executed when I had these values here, I would want to join A, A and B first and then join C. But maybe for another set of values, I want to join uh, B and C first followed by A. But I don't know that because all I have are these, these placeholder, uh, these variable markers here. So I don't know actually what values are going to be used. So there's a couple of different ways we can handle this with prepared statements in a query optimizer. So the easiest thing to do is uh, every so often uh, we just use whatever the last plan it is that we had. Uh, so let's say that the, we call a prepared statement. We don't actually prepare it right, right there. We don't want it through the, the, through the query optimizer. But when someone actually invokes it and executes it and use, ex uses the prepared statement, now we get some values. We can then say, well, let's just assume that those values are what we're going to are going to re represent what we're always going to see, and I just cache that plan, right? And just always use whatever I used before. So I think this is what Postgres does, right? It's 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 pretty simple. The next alternative is that you actually lose all the benefit of of getting a prepared statement, where you essentially run it through the optimizer every single time you invoke it. You can be a little bit clever and try to use whatever the last plan you had as the starting point in the search. Uh, at least have that say, you know, here's, here's a good starting place for my physical plan and base your search for the a better plan off of that rather than from starting from scratch every single time. Um, that essentially using the, the previous plan as, as an upper bound, um, that is tricky because that requires you to engineer your optimizer to be able to restart it from a, an existing physical plan. Um, and most optimizers are, are, written, are, are not written to handle that. Another approach is to generate multiple plans for your prepared statement. So uh, you could say, well, I know I, I, if I'm doing a prepared statement that has, one, that has one input parameter on this one column, I can look at my histograms or statistics that I've collected through the analyze keyword or the analyze command about what the distribution of values look like for that column. And maybe I break them up into to buckets in my histogram and I, for each bucket, I'll generate a, a, a generate a plan. So now when I invoke the prepared statement, I look at the value being passed in and I figure out what bucket it belongs to and that's the plan I use. So for one variable, that's easy to do. If now I have multiple variables, now it becomes exponential or, or the, the number of plans that I'm gonna have, possibly have it to, it would explode and that would be expensive to do. So I don't think uh, Oracle might do something like this, uh, but I, I might be wrong. Like there's sort of more primitive versions of trying to look at, have an exhaustive uh, grid of all possible plans. The last one is just to say, well, I know what my parameters are. I can infer what columns doing doing look doing lookups on, or what attributes they're accessing, and I'll just look at my statistics, take the average value that each of those columns uh, could represent, and use that as the input parameters when I prepare the uh, prepare you know, when I invoke the prepared statement through the query optimizer. So again, there's not one uh, approach that that all systems actually use. This is obviously the easiest one. Um, but I think this is actually a good research question and I want to investigate at some point as well. All right, the next thing we got to deal with is, is stability. So plan stability means that the, uh, that the performance of the query, of a particular query, will be consistent from one day to the next. Like if I run the query today and it takes an X amount of time, if I run that same query tomorrow on the same sort of database, uh, you know, module some minor changes, I should, should take this roughly about the same amount of time. Right? What I don't want to happen is I run my query today and it's, it's, you know, it's 
it, it, it takes this time, I run it tomorrow, and it t it's half the cost is, the execution time is cut in half, but then the, the day after that, now it's back to the original time. Like, I don't want those oscillations because that makes it super tricky for, for us to identify performance bottlenecks and performance issues. DBAs are very conservative about upgrading database systems, uh, database system software, because you know, they rather have stability than just you know, better performance all the time. Um, so how can we achieve stability in our queries? So uh, again, this is all about the query optimizer. So we wanna make sure that our query optimizer is generating plans for queries that from one day to the next uh, will have you know, can, can sta stable performance. So one approach is to, to provide hints to the query plan. So this is where essentially you can annotate the query either through like special comments in the header or, or uh, if it's a graphical tool, you, sometimes you can do this, where you can specify what you want the query optimizer actually to, to do, right? For certain choices it has to make. So oftentimes you'll see this like, I, you, you, can, you can provide a hint to the optimizer and say, this query should, you know, should use this index on this table. I don't care about other indexes or scans, so make sure you use this index, right? Or the join ordering would be another common one. Another one is to, uh, uh, you can tell some database systems which optimizer version they wanna use for a particular query. So a lot of times when people upgrade the database system software, uh, this is, this is in particular for Oracle, you can specify which version of the optimizer you want the queries to use, because if you've already vetted, say, a previous version and the optimizer generated plans that you can understand and you have stable performance numbers, when you do the upgrade, maybe you don't want to upgrade the optimizer and have it generate different plans for queries, and now the, the numbers may, may vary, right? So again, DBAs are very conservative. It's not, it's not helpful if we upgrade the database system software and 99% of the queries now run faster, but then 1% of the queries run slower because the optimizer picked a, a different plan than it used to. Uh, that's gonna be bad because the people whose queries run slower now are gonna get on the phone and call you and complain and say, why is my query run slower? Please fix it. The, the, the other 99% of the queries, those people aren't gonna call and say, you know, thank you for making their queries run faster. People don't do that. It's when things go bad, that's when people complain, right? So. In this case here, again, so if I upgrade if I upgrade Oracle, I can say I want to run with the previous optimizer because that'll generate plans that I, that, I've, I, that I know about. The last choice is to support backwards compatible plans. And so the idea here is that if I say I upgrade my database system software, but before I do that on the old system, I dump out or export all the plans for my prepared statements or queries that I'm, I'm executing all the time uh, into a bunch of files, then I upgrade the database system software and then I load back in those plans from the previous version of the software and override any decision that the optimizer would make. You're saying, you know, for this query, absolutely use this plan. So that, that guarantees you've had the same plan that, that, that you had before. So SQL Server allows you to do this. SQL Server, you can dump out the query plans as, as XML and then load them back into to new versions. All right, so the last thing we talk about is search term termination. So again, when you're on the command line, you, write, you type a query in, you hit enter, and it's gonna run the query optimizer. Uh, and so you need a way for the query optimizer to determine I've run long enough and I need to stop. Uh, because again, some of these problems, for very complex queries, you know, it's the, the search space is NP complete, so you can just be running this for days and days and days, uh, and people aren't gonna like that. So uh, the most obvious thing to do is just set a wall clock time barrier that says that if my optimizer runs for a certain amount of time, I just kill it and I stop, right? Another approach is to have a cost threshold where you say that uh, if I find a plan, uh, uh, if, if I find a plan that has a lower cost than some threshold that I want, or another one might be if, I, if I've run for a certain amount of time and I don't find a plan that's you know 20% or 10% better than the best plan I've seen so far, then I just go ahead and stop myself. The last one is basically you say, if you can identify that there's no more possible permutations or, or enumerations you can do for the target plan, uh, then you know you, you're done for the search. Um, and typically this is done on, on a per group basis, right? Because if it's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of tables, there'll be a lot of joins and you'll, you'll never actually exhaust this, right? So to give one example of how this is used uh, in the case of, of uh, MySQL, you can specify the optimizer search def in the search tree. 
So uh, this prevents you from going maybe too far down in the branching um, and you sort of artificially cut off the search so, you know, so many levels deep so that, that you exhaust the, the number of possible choices more quickly. Um, it's, some systems try to be dynamic and it's often hard to get this right. Uh, so this is, this is one sort of, I guess, semi-famous blog article from Percona, who's one of the major MySQL uh, uh, consulting companies and do a lot of development with MySQL. So back in 2012, they talked about how they had this, uh, they had this one customer that was doing a, a select query on, on 20 tables uh, and the optimizer took, took five seconds to find the query plan. And the query only ran for 50 milliseconds because it was reading a thousand tuples. And so by setting that like search depth and artificially cutting it off from just doing an exhaustive search, they were able to get it down, you know, the, the optimizer to finish in, in milliseconds. So all the various data systems have, have different tools to, to figure these things out. All right, so now we wanna talk about the, so again, these are all the, we just talked about all the design decisions we have to consider when we wanna build our optimizer, how to handle prepared statements, how to decide when to finish, when to finish searching, what to actually do our search on, one query, multiple queries, things like that. Now we want to talk about what the search is, what, you know, what the, the sort of, what the optimizer actually looks like. How is it actually going to generate a physical plan from a logical plan? So the way to think about what we're going to talk about today is we're going forward in both time and complexity. So like from a time meaning like historical point. So like heuristics based optimizers of what they, they first built in the 1970s and going forward in, in this, the, you know, we're coming the newer, newer implementations. The other thing I also think about too, is these are, these are the, the, the heuristic based one is the most simplest way to build an optimizer. Although the engineering side of it can get very, very messy. Um, but going down the, the, the implementations become more complex and therefore the types of query optimizations and rules they, and transformations they can apply become more sophisticated. So we'll talk about, uh, you know, these, these are worth talking about because this is what you'll see often when people first build a database system because they're not gonna have a cost-based search model. They're gonna use heuristics and sometimes heuristics can still be, are still widely used today. Um, and then the unified search and stratified search is where we'll end up, we'll talk a little bit about today. We'll get up to uh, the volcano optimizer and then that'll segue into the next lecture when we talk about cascades in more detail. Okay, so the very first query optimizers for the relational database systems in the 1970s, for two of the three first relational database systems, uh, were using uh, heuristic-based uh, tr transformations. And the idea here is that in the code itself, you're, you're, you define these, these rules that will transform the logical operators into physical operators. So the the most common thing would be like if I'm doing a scan and I know I have like an index that ha that matches all the predicates in my where clause, then that's the index I would want to use, right? So that's sort of like that searchable stuff that we talked about a few slides before. Um, so that's the thing, that's sort of the standard transformations you can do from logical to physical. But some of the optimizations you can do to improve query performance will be applying all the the and you know, the basic rules you want to have for query execution, like predicate pushdown, uh, limit pushdowns, and things like that. Right, predicate pushdown would be instead of having uh, you know the, the maybe the predicate at the top of the query plan, I push it all the way down to my access method so that I'm filtering out tuples as, as quickly as possible and not not you know passing it from one operator to the next because that would be expensive. Another common thing will also be to do to handle join ordering through just cardinality estimates. They would say that you know we have joining two tables, you know which one potentially you you can approximate which one is going to have. Uh, more tuples feeding into the join operator. So you make that one versus one the outer versus one the inner, right? So it's simple rules like that. So the important thing to understand about this is that there's no cost model involved in this. It's all static. It's like, I see a query, a query plan has this uh, pattern in it. I always apply this rule, right? I, I always push down the, 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 the predicate, things like that. So as I said, the, the, Two of the three first relational database systems from the major relational database systems from the 1970s, uh, Ingress out of Berkeley uh, from Mike Stonebreaker and Oracle from, from Larry Ellison, uh, this is what, what they used. And the, again, from, from back then, like the, the, the resources that they had for, you know, for, you know, for computing resources to run, actually run the database system software itself was, was quite limited. Uh, 
So the size of the databases they were trying to store back in the 1970s were super small, right? So like in, we'll talk about this in a second, in the case of the Ingress paper uh, uh, here, like they're talking about, you know, scanning tables with like 300 tuples, right? That's, that's like, that's nothing. So the complexity of the problem they were trying to deal with is, is uh, the kind of queries they were trying to deal with is, is was much, uh, much less than what, what we deal with today. In the case of Oracle, like Oracle, you know, they got huge and got, you know, a lot of money riding on, a, you know, a, the, the simplest type of sort of optimizer you can have. Like a, a, one that doesn't have a cost model, that all the things we're going to talk about in, in going forward. Like they got huge just based on this. So I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound or sound like I'm saying you can't, you can't have a sophisticated data system without having a cost-based optimizer. Clearly Oracle got quite far with it. Um, but again, back in the 1990s, the type of queries they were dealing with, like the SQL 92 standard, no CTEs, no window functions, no user-defined aggregates, right? All of these things didn't exist. So it, it, it is actually viable. But again, also Mongo got really big without having having a, a cost-based optimizer as well. So I've talked to some people that worked on the, uh, the Oracle Query Optimizer like back in the day in the 1980s, 1990s, and they would say that... Uh, it, it was the largest piece of code in the system uh, and it was quite sophisticated in what it could do, but it was like an engineering nightmare because everything was written in C. There wasn't no de you know, high level DSL or declaration of the rules, right? It was a bunch of if, if then else statements. Uh, and so again, they had a lot of money and they had some really smart people and they could have done you know, amazing things by expanding this, but it just got to become untenable. All right, so then that's why they switched over to the the, the, you know, the cost-based models, cost-based searches that we'll talk about in a second, right? So again, this is what Ingress did at the beginning. This is what Oracle is saying in the beginning. I'm not saying that this is the right way to do it. In some cases it is, some cases it's not. Uh, and so let's talk about what Ingress does. Again, this is mostly just for her historical curiosity, right? So going forward, we're gonna use uh, the following three table schema and with an example query of uh, Spotify or Apple iTunes uh, database. So we have artists and we have albums and then al artists appear on albums. So we're just keeping track of like what, you know, what, what, what records or what, what albums are being put out and what artists are on that. So let's talk about what Ingress does. So this is what Ingress used back in the 1970s. So for this, we're gonna use this query here where it's a three-way join between artists, appears and album. And we wanna get all the artists that appear on my, my mixtape. All right. So Ingress didn't, the way it did joins is that, well, actually, how do I say this? Ingress didn't support joins. Uh, so they had to rewrite all the queries into single table queries. Because right? again, because they, they couldn't join tables together. So the first step, what they would do is they would take a join query like this and then they would then decompose it into single value queries. So what do I mean by that? So say we take this query here and we're gonna rewrite it into two queries. So the first query now is gonna just, just be on the album table where we're doing the lookup on the album name because that's what we're passed in over here, right? And so this is just a select on the single table here, but then we're gonna write it out into a temp table. And then now for this query here, we replace album with our temp table reference uh, here and here. So now we're gonna re recursively now rewrite this query to remove again the, the, the joins that we have. And so now we're gonna have the this new query here that just does a lookup on appears with a join on temp one, and it's gonna write the output into temp two. Then this query on the artist table will do a lookup uh, or do the join against temp two. So now once you do this once you do this rewriting, you're gonna then substitute the values from these temp tables with the actual values that are produced by the query. So say we execute this first one here, we'll then generate, get the output of the album ID 999. So then now we go to the next query and we replace the reference to temp one now with 9999 that's being generated by the previous query. So now this is no longer a join. This is a single statement or single table query. And I'm just substituting that value in that it produced from the, the, the previous query. Same thing here, this query runs, now produces two output, and then now I can rewrite this query into two queries, one that takes artist ID one, two, three, and then the other one that takes artist ID four, five, six, 
and I can execute both of them, produce results of those queries, combine them together, and then that's the output of, of my join, right? So this is pretty impressive, right? This is like a way to do rewriting of queries. Uh, I mean, I'm showing this on the on a SQL level. They would be doing this on the, the, the physical plan level. Um, it, you know, this allows them to execute joins without actually having a join implementation. Like you're just doing these single statement selects. So it's been argued that this is actually an early example of adaptive query optimization because rather than doing the static optimization approach where I would uh, generate the plan all at once for my entire query, um, I could take the SQL query here. I see as a misspoke, they were not operating on physical plans. They're probably operating on, on logical plans. Uh, but I could take this query here uh, and only when I get the values one, two, three that I want to substitute, substitute into it, then I fire it off or send it off to the query optimizer and then generate the physical plan for it. So it's sort of like a late binding uh, optimization approach, right? So like, like I can learn from information about what's coming out of these queries to decide what the best way to execute this particular query is. It's sort of, again, it's not exactly what adaptive query optimization is, but it, it, they're essentially running the optimizer on a per tuple basis, uh, which nobody does today. Okay. So, all right, what are some advantages and disadvantages of the heuristic-based optimization? So one, it's, it's easy to implement. Uh, it's easy to debug because you just walk through with GDB or whatever your favorite debugger is and step through and see what, what rules actually get fired uh, and in order to determine why, you know, why I chose one particular plan versus another, right? Um, and as I said, when you, when you build a new database system today, just to get it up and running and execute some first queries, you can get pretty far with a heuristic-based op heuristic optimizer. The downside, though, is that oftentimes if uh, you will have to have these, uh, these constant thresholds or, or, or values baked in the source code itself or defined in a configuration file to help you make determination about certain decisions you have to make. Um, like if I wanted to determine whether a, if I want to do a join, a, convert a, a logical join plan or operator into a physical join operator, and I need to determine whether it's sort merge join is faster than a hash join, I have to have some notion of, of, of sort of baked in costs that make that decision. Um, and oftentimes it's, it may have no bearing to actually what the data looks like, uh, so that can be tricky. The other tricky thing about this is that it's gonna be basically impossible now to generate uh, plans when the transformations or optimizations you wanna apply can have dependencies in between them. So that means that like, say you, you wanna, I wanna determine I want to apply optimization A, and based on whether or not I, I choose that optimization, I may want to, may or may not want to choose optimization B. And so now, if I, if I'm writing this in just based rules, I have to write that explicit rule to know that if I do A, then don't do B, or I do don't do A, then I can do B. I have to write all that manually in, in the source code. Um, we're in a cost-based search, we'll talk about the next slide. If you write your cost model in a correct way, you could have the search sort of the, the search uh, engine sort of find that for you, right? And you, and you don't have to encode it directly. So again, as I said, the heuristic based approach is what the first two out of the three original relational database systems, the major relational database systems that came out in the 1970s actually used. The other uh, sort of famous approach used in the 1970s uh, it was a combination of the heuristics from we just talked about plus a cost-based search. And this is gonna be the technique that uh, all the modern optimizers that we'll talk about will be, will be based on. Right? They may not be using exactly the approach that IBM System R is using, uh, but this notion of using a cost model to estimate the efficacy or the, the cost estimate of a plan uh, is, is the standard approach that everyone's using. So with System R, the way it's gonna work is uh, they'll have static rules, first perform some initial optimizations, and then they'll use a dynamic programming method uh, to determine the best join ordering for the tables. So I think we talked about IBM System R a little bit, but uh, again, Ted Codd was a mathematician in New York. He wrote these, uh, for IBM, wrote this, 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 this uh, far-reaching and, and, and very progressive paper on the relational model, but it was all mathematical. Uh, 
Ingress and Ber the Ingress team at Berkeley was was one people one group of people that took the paper and tried to build a system. IBM tried to build an, uh, their own version of the system at called System R in San Jose in California, um, and they got a bunch of people who had PhDs in, in you know, brand new PhDs in computer science mathematics. Put them in a room at IBM, gave them Ted Koss paper, and says, "All right, go go make this." And so a bunch of people carved off different pieces of of the problem. You know, one person with a PhD went and invented SQL. Another person invented uh, uh, storage models or, or, or two-phase locking. Um, Pat Salinger was somebody who, who got signed to work on the uh, query optimizer. Um, and it's been very, very seminal work. So this is the first example of a cost-based query optimizer. Uh, it's also an example of using bottom-up planning or forward chaining. We'll explain in a few more slides what that actually means. But basically, it's like we're going to do a divide and conquer approach where we're going to start with nothing uh, in our query plan and then iteratively build it up to say to, to produce our final result by figuring out what the join order is going to be. So as I said, System R was the first system that used this particular implementation. Uh, the first version of DB2 that came out in the 1980s, I think, borrowed the, the query optimizer from System R. And then most open source database systems are going to be using some flavor of the of the, the system R approach. Uh, like this is what MySQL, Postgres, and, and SQLite use. Um, the commercial guys usually are, are, are something more sophisticated or, or using cascades. All right, so let's go through an example of what it's actually doing. So again, the way a system R approach would work is that you'd break up the query into blocks, and then you would have logical uh, operators representing each block. And then for each of these logical operators, you're gonna figure out what are all the possible physical operators I could use to implement that operator. And then you're going to iteratively construct uh, a, a, a query plan that has the minimal cost. Right? Essentially, you're stitching together all the tables you want to access in, in, uh, and joins to figure out how to join all of them and produce the final result. So one important observation that IBM made at the time was that they were only going to pursue uh, left deep join trees. So that means that like all the joins are sort of only on, the, on this left side of the tree going up. And contrast this with like a bushy tree where you can, you know, I can join A and B, join C and D, and take the output of those two separate joins and join them together. This would join, a lefty tree would join A and B first, then take the output of that and join it with C, then take the output of that and join it with D. And they made this decision to only look at left deep trees uh, purely to minimize or uh, reduce the search space of the problem, right? So if you have to go consider bushy trees, then that, um, then you know, that increases the number of, of, of choices you have to look at. And again, for the, for the hardware they were dealing with at the time, that was deemed too expensive. Sometimes you see this optimization or this assumption made in, in optimizers today, uh, even though sometimes a bushy plan will, will be uh, preferable, will be better. Um, it, it depends on the system, right? But there's, there's nothing about the approach I'm talking about here today that requires you to have to only support left deep trees. That's just you know, a shortcut they took back in the 70s. All right, so let's go back to my, my query they had before. Uh, the one difference I'm going to make is that now I'm going to uh, sort the output of this result based on the artist ID, right? So again, the first step in system R is that we want to choose the best access path for each table. So here's all the tables that I'm going to access. Here's all my predicates, and I'm going to pick some, you know, what's the best access method for, for them. So in the case of artists and peers, I don't have a... Uh, I don't have a um, I don't have a, a, a index I can use, so they're doing sequential scans. Album and say has an index on the name, and we'll, we'll use that. Now, for given, we're going to enumerate all possible join readings for these tables. Again, this is just like uh, you know a, a permutation of every possible different ordering uh, that my, my my tables could have, and I can do joins, I can do Cartesian products, although well, we can prune those out later. Right? So then now, for all these possible orderings, I want to figure out what is the one that it's going to have the, the lowest cost. And I need to base that cost on what physical operator I'm going to use. Right? So this is just a logical plan. I want to join artists and appears and album. But I'm not saying how to actually do that join. In this last step here, this is actually where we want to figure it out. So system R is a bottom-up approach where we're going to start at the bottom of the query plan where we don't have any information, we haven't done any of the joins yet. We just say, we have these three tables, artist, album, and appears. Uh, and this is, this is where we want to get to at the top. So we want to figure out how do we start joining these together 
to get to this final result here, right, where, we, where we've joined artist, peers, and album together. So we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at all possible join orderings for the first stage. So I want, I want to take two tables and join them together. So I can join artist and peers, album appears, appears and album, and then all the other ones that I showed in the, the last slide. I'm, just, I'm truncating here because we're out of space. And then what I have is going out, emanating from the starting point, I have a path to get there that's going to use a particular physical algorithm. Right? So I can either do a hash join or to join artists and peers, or I could do a sort merge join to, to join artists and peers. And likewise, to join album and peers, I can do a hash join, a sort merge join, and so forth. Right? But then now, for each of these uh, different physical, physical operators, I can estimate what is the cost of executing it. And then I, for each, uh, from going from one node to this, I want to then select which path uh, to get to that node has the lowest cost. So let's say it's in this case here, to go from this node to this node, the hash join has a lower cost. Same with this one to here, but this one, the sort merge, has a lower cost. So then now, I want to do the same thing starting from the next level of, of my, my query plan. I want to say, well, what physical operator could I use to, to do the, the last join? Right? So again, I'm showing a subset here. I could do a sort merge join or a hash, mer hash, hash join for these different approaches. And then now the same thing. I want to pick which plan or which, which physical operator from going from one node to the next has the lowest cost. And then now once I have this, I backtrack and say, well, what was the path that got me from my starting point to my end point going through these physical operators that, that had the, the, the lowest cost? And that's and say that it's doing a hash join followed by a hash join. And that's the one that, that produces the, the lowest cost amongst all the joins. And that's the one I want to use. Right? Again, the divide and conquer, because rather than looking at uh, you know, complete paths uh, you know, you know, from here to here in, in order to estimate the cost, I'm only going from one stage to the next, and then once I figure that out, then I go to the next stage, and then I combine it together, and that, that produces the result. So, for this particular query, though, uh, remember that I've added the order by. So, uh, so now I care about the, 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 what's the sort order of the output after I join them. But there's nothing in this, in this plan that I've generated here that tells me how, what, what that sort order could be, right? And this is because at least how system R was sort of set up, there's no notion of, of uh, the, the physical properties or the sort order of the, the data that I wanted. So in this case here, I, I'm doing hash joins, and that means that the data is going to be random in a random sort order, and then I need to now execute an order by, a sort, a sort operator, to put the data into the physical order that I want. But going back here, if I had known that I needed this data to be sorted a certain way, then maybe I would have cho chose a sort, sort merge join, because that would have given me a two for one. That would have given me the do the join plus put the data sorted in the way that I wanted it. Right? But because the way this is set up, there's nothing about the physical property of the data that, that can make, help you make this decision. So that's actually going to be one of the limitations we'll see with system R, and we'll see how we can, we can fix this up uh, uh, in, in the stratified or unified searches later on. Um, the, uh, yeah. So the way system R actually got around this was that they would actually have to bake in the cost model itself some notion of the, of the sort order that they wanted data to be in so that they can then identify that the sort merge w was preferable to the, to the hash join and, and for this particular example. But that was, you know, that's sort of a hack, right? Because now you're, there's logic of what the data should look like is in the, in the cost model and, as, and then it's sort of separate from the actual the, the search strategy itself. Right, so that's an issue. So I briefly want to touch on this, this distinction between the, the bottom up and the, and the top down. So again, what, what I just showed you is considered a bottom-up query optimization strategy. Uh, it's where you start with nothing, then you build a plan up to get to the output that you want. So System R and, and IBM Starburst that came later on, these are examples of bottom-up approaches. Um, the dynamic approaching we'll, we'll see in Hyper, this is also considered a bottom-up approach. The, uh, the current feeling from the, the research community is that this approach is better uh, for figuring out the join ordering. Um, the alternative is the top-down approach, which is what we use in our system based on cascades. 
And this is where you start with the outcome that you want, and then you work down the, the, into the query plan, and you start adding in physical operators to, to essentially reverse the steps and get, back, get you back to where the goal you needed. Um, so again, Volcano was, Volcano and Exodus came from the, uh, the same guy that did Cascades. Cascades is considered the modern implementation of this. So we'll, we'll cover this, uh, we'll cover this furthermore, I think, in next class. Um, I don't want to say too much, but, but like, this is what SQL Server and CockroachDB use. This is what our system uses. A bunch of other systems use this. So this is sort of like, again, the, the hash join versus cert merge join debate in, for join algorithms for databases. This is sort of the same thing if you care about query optimizers. This is sort of the same debate pe people can have. Okay, so let's talk about what Postgres does uh, a little bit. So Postgres actually does what the system R approach is. Um, for, uh, it, usually th this is the case, right? We'll talk about their other query optimizers in a second, but if you come along, if you actually a query in Postgres that only joins uh, 12 tables, then this is what you get. If you have more, 13 or more tables, then you get this genetic algorithm, which we'll talk about in a few more slides. The way it works is that they have this rewriting phase that has all the static rules that we talked about that can do some initial rewriting or optimizations on, on, the, on the query plan. Then they throw it into a, uh, a cost-based search model using the bottom-up approach, the same one as, as system R, to figure out the join ordering. Then after that, they go back and add on uh, the, the, the remaining things that are missing in, in the query plan. So these would be things like the sort order or any kind of aggregation you would have to have, right? So the, the and then you, you do the same thing, for, 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 you just recursively do the same steps for, for any subqueries. So uh, the Postgres is phenomenal. I think the Postgres code is, is actually one of the most beautiful database system source codes I've ever seen. Um, you know, at least anyone written in C. Uh, the query optimizer is sort of like the, in my opinion, at least the last time we looked at it a few years ago, is one of the dark corners of, of the system. And so the, it's, it's, I've been told this is very brittle because you implicitly have in the source code for like the rewriting phase steps that like you basically bake in the source code assumptions about what the output of that data needs to look like or the query plan needs to look like in order for it to be then fed into the, the next set of you know heuristics or transformations that you're actually doing. So if you change sort of some assumption you, you have about what the the next stage expects the, the query plan to look like, if you somehow the, the query plan you're generating or, or produce is now different, then that could break everything everything else. Um, and this is sort of why I like the cascades or unified approach we'll talk about in a second, because you declare all your rules, you declare all your transformations and, and the physical properties you expect the, the query plan to, to maintain. And then you just throw it in the engine and let it let it figure it out for you, and it enforces all these things for you. Whereas this one, it's it's you have to understand what the you know you, in order to modify anything, you have to understand you know every single step what, what's actually happening. All right, so uh, so again, advantages or disadvantages of the system R approach. So the advantage is that it usually finds a reasonable plan, uh, uh, at least for a join ordering for a you know, moderate size number of joins. Our number of tables uh, in a reasonable amount of time without having to do an exhaustive search. Um, the downside is that you're going to have all the same problems you had in the heuristic only approach because that's the first step you're applying before you go into, into the search. Uh, this is only really a limitation for system R that they, they're limited to uh, left deep trees. Modern systems I don't think have that issue. Um, and then in the example I showed before where you need to have the cost model be aware of what your data needs to look like uh, if you have like you know sort orders or, or, or you know, compression and other properties on the data, you got to bake that into the cost model because the search algorithm itself is can't can't enforce that. So uh, th this last one is the worst part. This this is this is the major limitation you're going to have using the system R, system R approach uh, of using the cost model to enforce physical properties. Right. That, I, I think again. I think this makes the, the from an engineering standpoint this is problematic. So. Before we get into the, uh, the, the, the sort of the modern uh, query optimizer implementations, I want to talk about a, another class of optimizers um, that are using randomized al algorithms. And this is another way to think about the, the problem we're trying to solve in, in the query optimizer. So the idea with the randomized algorithm is that rather than doing this, uh, this sort of branch and bound search looking for a, a better, better query plan, 
we're just going to take our query plan and uh, do random permutations on it and just do a random walk of all possible valid uh, query plans. And then if we just happen to stumble upon one that's actually better, then that's the one we'll end up using, right? And so for this one, this is where you actually need that threshold, like a time threshold to be able to say, I've, I've searched long enough, I know, I know when to stop, because otherwise th this thing will just, just run forever. So an example of this will be Postgres' genetic algorithm, which is actually in, in the real system today. We'll talk about the next slide, but let's, before that, there was the implementation uh, using simulated annealing. So this is back in like 1987. As far as, in, as far as I know, this actually never actually made it into a, a real system. The basic idea is that you start with your query plan that you generate using the, so the heuristic based approach that we talked about in the beginning. And then now you just do random permutations of operators in the query plan, uh, like swapping the join order two tables. And then you estimate the cost of that, of, of that change, of, of, of that new query plan. And if it's better, then you, you just accept the change. If it's worse, then you flip a weighted coin to decide whether you want to keep it or not. Um, and then the idea here is that every so often you'll get a, you'll, you'll get a, uh, by accepting a, a change or accepting a new plan that actually made things worse, uh, this allow you to potentially break out of, of local minimums and then find the, 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 the true, you know, the true optimal. So the tricky thing about this though, is that you have to write rules that make sure you enforce any, uh, the, the correctness of the query plan so that you don't end up producing, you know, incorrect results. So like if my, uh, if my data needs to be sorted and I randomly permute the query plan by putting the sort, uh, the order by operator before the hash join, and then now my output's not gonna be sorted, I'm gonna end up with incorrect results. So you have to, you have to write all these rules to make sure that th this happens correctly, which can, can be tricky because there's, there's a lot of uh, corner cases. An example of a randomized algorithm that is actually used in production is the Postgres genetic optimizer. So again, the way this works is that if you, we use the system R approach we talked about before, if your query has 12 tables, uh, if you try to join 13 or more, then you get this one. Um, you can turn this on and off. There's a threshold to say when this actually kicks in, but by default, I think it's, I think it's 13 tables. So they're gonna use a genetic algorithm where at the beginning of every round, they're gonna generate a bunch of different permutations or, 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 or random variations of the query plan. Then they're gonna generate, estimate the cost of all those uh, permutations. And then they'll pick some number of ones that, that have the lowest cost as the ones to propagate from one uh, you know, for, to the next generation. And then you have some mutator function to flip around or randomly permeate the, the best plans. Right? The idea is like you're getting genes from the best plans and hopefully producing offspring that produce even better plans. So visually it looks like this. So let's say that we, in our first generation, for a simple, simple say, say a three table join, we can estimate the cost of, of each of these and say this one ends up being the lowest cost. So we update our lowest cost flag over here. And then uh, we're gonna randomly permute aspects of this. We feed that over to this one and we kill off this one. And then now same thing, we estimate the cost, find the one that has the lowest cost. This, in this case here, this one is lower than this one. So that's our new best one we've ever seen. Pick these, keep these two guys around, flip some stuff and generate new costs like that. And we just keep going on over and over again uh, until we find, until we run out, run out of time. So what are the advantages of this? Well, jumping around in random locations allows us to get our local minimums and potentially we could find a um, better plan. To the best of my knowledge, I've not seen any detailed analysis or uh, experiments about how good the Postgres genetic optimizer actually is compared to you know, so letting the, the, the regular optimizer run for longer. Um, we also have low memory overhead for doing the search because if we don't need to maintain the history of one generation to the next or of our random walk, then the, the, you know, the, the, the memory footprint is just whatever we use that, you know, whatever we're using for that, that current round. The disadvantages of though is that unless we do extra work to make sure that the randomness is deterministic, we could end up with uh, you know, a system that's difficult to debug to determine why uh, one, you know, why the data systems, why the data systems queries optimizers decided to use one plan versus another. In the case of, of Postgres, 
they always make sure that the, the, the random seed is consistent uh, for a given query. So if I run the query today through the genetic optimizer and I run it tomorrow with the same query, I'll, I'll always produce the same plan. And we still also have to still maintain any correctness rules to make sure that we don't do any mutations that end up uh, with an invalid query. Okay, so we're going a bit long here, but this is good stuff. I, I enjoy it. So uh, the one observation we can make is that everything we talked about so far is, uh, you know, mostly you should imagine writing all these transformation rules and these algorithms in a procedural language like C or C++. And this is tricky to do because there's no way to verify uh, precisely or through formal methods that the, the, the transformations that we're, we're applying are correct, that we're, we're, we're making sure that we, when we do a transformation from one query plan to the next, uh, that, you know, that, that those two algebraic expressions are actually equivalent. Right, and so we could try to verify this by running lots of fuzz tests with random queries and just checking that the output is the correct. But of course, this is like trying you're trying to prove a, a negative, which is not easy to do. So, actually, let me let let out the terror one sec. So a better approach to doing this would be if we could have a way to declare what our transformation rules are through like a high level language or DSL. And then we can have, uh, we could feed this into an optimizer engine who could then generate the code or apply these rules for us. Uh, so that way now through these declared, this declarative rule, rule, rule set, we can then do our verification or analysis on those rules to determine that they are correct. And as long as we, you know, we're reasonably sure that our, that our rule engine is correct to execute them, we would know that we're always doing transformations that, that are that are that are um, that are valid. So, this was the uh, this was the movement in the late 1980s, early 1990s to develop what are called optimizer generators. Uh, and think of these as like as a framework that allows a data system developer to declare the rules for transforming queries to generate optimal plans. Um, and then this, this would all be separate from the search strategy that we talked about before, right? These are like, you know, do predicate pushdown. You declare a rule to do that. So no matter whether we were doing heuristics or a, like the, the system R search, we could be guaranteed that we, we, would, we would produce that, that, that transformation uh, correctly, right? So the first example of, of, uh, of this kind of optimizer was in the Starburst system. Uh, Exodus was another first sort of famous one. Uh, this is with IBM. This was as an academic system. And then there's been uh, some variations, improvements from the guy that built Exodus of Volcanoes Cascades. Op++ was at Wisconsin. Columbia was another one at uh, Query Optimizer in, in the late 1990s at, at Portland. Since then, uh, there really hasn't been that much research in this kind of uh, optimizer generators. Um, and they're primarily what people use today is, is based on this work done in, in the 1990s. So we'll go a little bit more detail about Starburst and Cascades uh, in next class, but I'll, I'll briefly talk about it just uh, them right now. So the, these optimizer generators, uh, again, they had this rule engine that allows you to apply these transformations. And then you could declare in the rule what physical properties do you want the operator to enforce on the data that it, that it was processing, like the sort order example that I showed before. But now the question is how we're we actually going to do, you know, apply these transformations and do the search for the optimal plan. So the two approaches are either do stratified search or unified search. So stratified search is essentially what I said the IBM or the system R approach was, where I can apply my transformations using heuristics without a cost model first, then I take that out, take that query plan and run it through a search model that could then find you know, the, the best join ordering. A unified search is where we're doing all aspects of the query plan planning at once. So the transformations for doing predicate pushdowns and all the sort of those static rules, if you will, they're done at the same time in the same uh, search space as you do the, figure out the best join order. So let's talk about the first one. So, Again, the stratified search is, is where you first rewrite the logical plan 
uh, using all the transformation rules. So you, you go from a logical plan to a logical plan. Again, this is the same thing they were doing in the heuristic base approach. And so this rule engine is going to check to see whether uh, the transformation you want to do is even allowed before it actually applies it. So this makes sure that, again, you don't end up with an invalid query plan state. So there's no cost model for this. Right? These are, again, the same thing we talked about at the beginning. I always want to do a predicate pushdown or a limit pushdown. I can write a rule to do that transformation. And then once, once this step is done, now you do the cost-based search to find a mapping from the logical plan to a physical plan. And that could be the, the join ordering, or it could be the, uh, you know, fig in, in figuring out whether you want a nested loop join or a cert merge join or a hash join, figuring out those algorithms. The most famous one of these uh, optimizer generators was, was Starburst, but IBM, led by Guy Lohman. Um, and again, this is just repeats what I said before. You have the query rewrite phase that does, uh, that can compute the transformations based on uh, these blocks and it doesn't have a cost model, and then you do the system R style search to, uh, to, to, to find, you know, join orders, things like that. So as far as you know, the latest version of IBM DB2, like their, you know, their enterprise uh, relational database system, is using this approach. I don't know of any other ones. I mean, Starburst was a, you know, a, a, a Starburst was, was a system developed at IBM, so it you know, obviously makes sense in, in, to go in DB2. I don't know of any other data system that, that follows this, this similar approach. So what are the advantages? Well, so in practice, it works well and gets fast performance. Uh, the uh, downside, though, is that uh, you have no way to clearly define the, the, the priorities you have for your transformations. Again, this will make more sense when we, when we talk about cascades, but Basically, like if I know I can't exhaustively search at everything, so maybe there's some transformations I want to look at first because I, th I think I'll get more, better benefit from them. And then, oh, and then that helps me to maybe then lower my upper bound for, uh, for my query. And then I know I can prune things out that maybe don't, aren't, or that are less helpful. So I'm going to apply those transformations first. So, that, so in, at least in the original version of Starburst, you couldn't do that. Um, the other aspect that, that they talk about in the paper that was a big pain was that because these transformation rules are based on relational calculus, uh, it became difficult to maintain and find programmers to write because writing r relational calculus code is, is sort of not, um, doesn't come natural to sort of regular systems programmers. Again, I don't know whether in the, you know, the, the Starburst papers from 19, uh, 1988, I don't know if since then uh, it's been rectified. All right, so quickly, the unified search is where you have this notion of the logical and logical and logical physical transformations done all together. Um, and so you don't have these separate stages because everything is just a transformation. You throw it into your rules engine. It does the search and applies these things uh, for you. So the, the major downside, the major tricky thing you have to deal with the unified search is that there's going to be so many transformations that you have to use a memoization table to make sure that you cache some of these transformations so that you're not replying, you know, applying the same change over and over again. So now this makes the, the memory footprint a little bit larger here because I have to maintain some, some history of transformations I've applied in the past to know whether I want to apply a new one in the future. So uh, Gertz Graffy was the same guy that did the volcano, uh, the, the you know, volcano iterator model we talked about before for query processing models. There's a volcano optimizer that's part of the same project. He's the same guy that did uh, some of the work that we talked about for, for you know, latching and locking in B plus trees. Um, so when he was an academic, he built a, a series of these, uh, these, these new systems that each had an a, a optimizer, uh, optimizer generator. So the second one here was, was uh, Volcano. And again, this was a general purpose-based, cost-based optimizer that had these equivalence rules baked into it for uh, relational algebra. It made it really easy to uh, add new rules. It treated first uh, physical properties of the data and that are as first class entities or, or components in the system itself. So you could, you could understand whether you were making a transformation that was valid or not um, as you were going along and rather than trying to clean up things after the fact. So this is an example of a top-down approach it will be the same thing that Cascades will use that we'll talk about next class. Um, but this is sort of like, this was like an early, prototype. This was a, a predecessor uh, to, to Cascades, right? So as far as I know, uh, 
Volcano, I mean, the Volcano system itself was using the optimizer. Other academic prototypes at the time were using this, but as far as I know, this approach is not used in uh, in any 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 major system. So let's look at an example here. God damn, don't re, don't restart. Okay, so uh, the first thing we want to do is start with a logical plan of what we want the query to be. So this is what we want our output to be. We want to do a three-way join between these tables, and we want to have an order by on the artist ID. So again, this is the opposite of what we saw in System R. System R, we started up here and said, here's all the tables we have, figure out how to get us up here. So we, this is where we start with, and, we want to, and then we're gonna go down and apply transformation rules to get us there, right? So we can evoke rules that, as we go down, to either do logical, logical transformations, so like taking you know, join on A and B, reverse that, and do a join on B and A, or we can do a logical physical, take, you know, join on A and B, and have it now be executed as a hash join on A and B, right? So we then add these nodes here to apply, apply these transformations, and then we, we connect them and say, how do we actually get there? And we can just keep going this down, we keep going down to do this until we reach the bottom. And in this case here, we could compute the cost of what our uh, query plan is here, and we keep track that as, as the, the lowest cost. So now we just keep doing looking at all possible other permutations, uh, and so forth until we find, uh, you know, in this case here, we, if we try to do a hash join, we know that doing this hash join would violate our physical ordering that we have, so we know that we can't do this. So we can introduce like a quick sort, uh, you know, to do the order by, and then now we can do the hash join and so forth, right? In this case here, say doing the quick sort plus the hash join is more expensive than doing the sort merge join followed by either the hash join or the sort merge join, so we can cut it off there. So you're doing branch and bound to identify that as I'm traversing the, the branch, traversing the tree, if I'm at a point where my query plan is already more expensive than the best plan I've seen before, I don't need to look at anything below it in the tree because I'll, I'll know I'll never get better than that. All right, so the advantage of, of, the, uh, of the Volcano Optimizer is that we have declarative rules to do our transformations, but Starburst had the same thing. But it's going to have better extensibility with a with an efficient search algorithm because we can reduce the number of redundant estimations we have to do by caching uh, our transformations. The problem, though, is that the uh, at least the way Volcano was implemented is that for every single possible uh, like for every single operator I'm looking at, I would expand out all possible combinations like or all, you know, transformations I could have, and then now start doing the the search on all those rather than maybe traversing all the way to the bottom uh, first. And then it was not easy to modify predicates. Uh, I don't remember, exactly remember what this, what this was about, but I think essentially it meant that you couldn't do rewriting of like where clauses because the, the optimizer itself only knew how to do transformations on physical operators and not the expression trees inside of them. So I rushed this at the end. It was just meant to show you what a, uh, what a top-down optimizer looks like but then next class we'll pick up on, on cascades. So hopefully the main takeaway from all of this is that uh, query optimization is super hard. Um, and this is part of the reason why the NoSQL systems, when they first came out maybe a decade ago, they, they basically didn't implement a query optimizer, right? Because they said, oh, you don't need to do joins. You don't need to declare a language like SQL. And part of the, the, the advantage of not supporting those things is that you didn't have to build a query optimizer. But now for the systems that did add something that looks like SQL, or at least a declarative language, they're having to go implement query optimizers. And then the, the quality of them can, can vary greatly. And they're usually gonna be heuristic-based systems. All right, so next class. Uh, we'll pick up, I'm discussing more optimizers. And then the real debate will be, again, this dynamic programming versus the Cascades approach. The, the bottom-up approach we saw in System R versus the top-down approach, which Volcano is an example of, but a Cascades, Cascades will be more sophisticated implementation. And the, this is what we use, use in our system today, okay? All right, uh, so again, uh, I'm meeting with everyone for the projects this week, and then we'll, on, the, uh, on Wednesday next week, we'll do the, the in-class presentations or over Zoom, okay? Wash your hands. See ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't quit.